Good evening. I'm Hope Coulter, director of the Hendricks Murphy Foundation and a member of the English department here at Hendricks. Welcome. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Hendricks Murphy Foundation Programs for Literature and Language. And we're grateful to all who make this programming possible, to Hendricks College, President Tsutsui, Provost Bonebright, to the faculty and students whose enthusiasm spurs us on, and to Hendricks Murphy Foundation sponsors and staff who work so hard to make our literary and language programming a success. After tonight's talk, there will be a reception and book signing in the gallery outside, and you'll have plenty of time to buy a book and get it autographed before you head out to your watch parties. <laughs> a couple of years ago, two colleagues and I led 12 students on a week-long odyssey trip to the Buffalo River. We studied many aspects of the river, from its natural history and geology, to its embattled status as the country's first national river, and the threats to its pristine condition that continue today. We hiked, floated, wrote creative responses to the river, and interviewed environmental activists, local residents, and pig farmers. One night, when we were setting up camp near the river, I found a nice flat place to set up my tent. It was a short distance from the students, just in case they were noisy and the ground was this nice sandy loam, my tent peg slipped in real easily. So I stretched out in my sleeping bag and read myself to sleep. I hadn't been asleep very long when I was awakened by one of the strangest sensations I've ever felt. Something about the size of a fist was moving under me, running up the length of my body and pushing at me. And as far as I knew, I was alone in the tent. It took me a few seconds to realize that I must have inadvertently pitched my tent over prime territory for a mole colony. I was now in extremely close contact with a mole, <laughs> separated from it by only a couple of layers of fabric. This was a distinctly unpleasant feeling. And I'm pretty sure the mole was none too pleased about it either. So she had just been going along, enjoying a nice night of tunnel burrowing, only to find her construction stymied by a sheet of nylon and my heavy body. By now, I was feeling actual scrabbling under my thin camping pillow. <laughs> and I lay there in the darkness, trying to recall everything I knew about moles, especially their size, because this one was now feeling pretty big and especially with regard to their teeth. <laughs> Jay Barth, whose tent was a few yards away, may tell you that there may have been some thrashing and cussing coming from my tent <laughs> at this point, but you know how political scientists stretch the truth. <laughs> of all the interactions with wild animals I've had in my life, this was definitely the weirdest and the most intimate. But our speaker tonight has devoted a lifetime to contemplating and writing about such encounters. Moments when we humans come up against, sometimes right against, the other animals who share this planet and our lives. When we confront them in all their similarity to us and their otherness and try to see them as they are. A military child who grew up mostly in New Jersey Cy Montgomery attended Syracuse University, where she majored in magazine journalism, French, and psychology. Her work in journalism soon developed a focus on science and nature, a career in writing that has taken her all over the globe and has resulted in 28 books for adults and children, many articles, and a number of literary awards. Cy has Arkansas roots through her mother's side of the family. If we could, Cy, we'd welcome you with the best of everything Arkansas has to offer. And that would include its animals. Flotillions of white pelicans and flying squirrels, squadrons of mules and armadillos and cave crawfish. But these critters proved a little hard to round up. <laughs> so you'll have to do, make do with a merely human greeting. Please help me welcome Cy Montgomery.
That was just a wonderful welcome, and I am having a blast here. I've found so many kindred spirits, and it's been wonderful meeting students and staff who are doing all these fabulous, fabulous things. Well, so far, I have been having a blast with my life, and I want to share with you um, a little bit of my background and share with you a bit about my new book, which just came out September 25th. And this is the, the last on my many uh, stops out of New England for um, the book tour for How to Be a Good Creature. But I want to start um, by introducing you to a little bit of what I've been able to do with my life as a writer chronicling the natural world. And I don't know, if, can we bring the, down the lights a little more? Because no one wants to look at me. Everyone would much rather look at the animals. I have, I get to meet all kinds of uh, wonderful new friends. As you can see, here's a cheetah who I got to know in Namibia when I was working with Dr. Lori Marker. I was working on a, a book for young readers in grades four through eight in a series that I founded with Dr. Nick Bishop, the photographer who takes the photos that comprise half the text. And um, what happened with Lori, she was a wonderful person who wanted, she wanted to be a vintner. And she started working in a wildlife park to make money so that she could be a vintner and fell in love with cheetahs, ended up being one of the first people to successfully breed them in captivity, discovered they were endangered, discovered that no one seemed to be doing anything about it. So she sold everything she owned and moved to Namibia and founded Cheetah Conservation Fund. So of course I had to write a book about her and got to meet some of the cheetahs who are ambassadors for their kind. Um, most of the cheetahs she works with are ones that she protects from ever having to be in captivity or be rehabilitated and released or become ambassadors. But the ones that are ambassadors are lovely, lovely friends. And boy, you haven't felt a good purr till you've had <laughs> a cheetah lying down next to you. Um, in, in my work as a journalist, I've also had the opportunity to swim with pink dolphins. And pink dolphins are not like the pink elephants my mother would see after three or four martinis. <laughs> These are real animals. They are pink river-dwelling whales who live in the Amazon and Orinoco rivers. And they are said to be magical. The local people will tell you that these beings can turn into people at will. They can assume human form. And that they'll show up at dances. They'll be a handsome stranger who you can't help but fall in love with. And you take your lover home. And he might give you a beautiful necklace or she might give you a, a lovely gold watch. But in the morning, you'll find your lover is gone and the gift has turned into a little pile of silvery fish because all the time you didn't realize that you had fallen in love with a dolphin. But I knew that I had, and the result was a book called Journey of the Pink Dolphins. I've also been lucky enough to meet these adorable little creatures. Don't they look like little watermelons? <laughs> I just... This is a baby tapir, and looking at my nose, you can see why I really identify with these animals. And in fact, there is a tapir named Cy Montgomery, and here she is with her evening swimwear. Um, she's got a radio collar on, and um, I get reports every once in a while from what Cy Montgomery is doing in the Pantanal of Brazil from Dr. Pat Patty Medici who um, was a researcher who I profiled in The Tapir Scientist. And there are wonderful octopuses in my life. Um, this is a female who I, I met in, well, let's see, where was it? I was in Oregon meeting her. Her name was Cleo. Um, I was, uh, at that time I had just recently published a book called The Soul of an Octopus, a title that until about 2015, when it was published, would have been deemed an impossible title because no one would believe that an octopus had a soul. But I believe it 
because I've gotten to know octopuses personally. I know they recognize me. There was also an octopus named Sai. Um, she's passed on now, but it was fun while I, I could walk through the New England Aquarium and hear people saying, oh, Sai is so beautiful. Sai is so strong. That is not something I normally hear. But in researching that book, I got to get up close and personal with octopuses. But of course, this posed the problem of how I would explain to my husband when I got home how I ended up covered with hickeys. <laughs> so my travels as, as a writer have taken me all over the world, including to the Gobi, the great desert in Mongolia, where I was researching a book on this creature. This is the snow leopard. You wouldn't think that a snow leopard would live in a rocky desert, but they do. Because animals have all kinds of amazing powers and they show up where you least expect them. And one of the places that you would not expect to find, for example, a tiger, would be a mangrove swamp like this one in Shunderman. This is the only mangrove swamp in the world stretching for 10,000 square kilometers between India and Bangladesh along the Bay of Bengal where tigers are found. And these are not just any tigers. These are the only tigers in the world who routinely hunt and kill people. They will swim out after your boat like a dog chases a car and they will get on board and eat you and this happens hundreds of times every year. So of course I wanted to go there. <laughs> and when my husband was worried, I said, don't worry, honey, they're man eaters. <laughs> well, of course the women stay home where they can be eaten by crocodiles. Well, I have had some wonderful teachers in my time and I want to introduce you to some of them, my first is uh, Walt Clarkson, who in my second high school was my journalism teacher. But, you know, I've kind of lived my life by this maxim that says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And sure enough, Mr. Clarkson appeared in my life at exactly the right moment. But sometimes the teacher's true might have two legs, but sometimes they have two legs and a beak. <laughs> sometimes they've got four legs, sometimes six, sometimes eight, and sometimes none at all. The thing is, teachers are all around us, and we must learn to recognize them. And often for me, my teachers have been animals. So this is something that other peoples who live close to the earth have recognized for millennia. The bear, for example, appears in Native American stories again and again as the one who taught the first people the use of medicinal herbs. Now, as you probably know, all medicine was plant medicine at one time, and now many of the medicines that we use are simply the exact molecule that is found in nature, but which is synthesized in the laboratory. Now Native Americans' knowledge about bears being teachers of medicine could be dismissed as just a no, another just-so story or a silly superstition, except it's true. People who live close to the earth are excellent observers of natural history. And I found that when I went to the Amazon, when people were telling me about dolphins that come out of the water and enchant us. I found it to be true in Shunderman, along the Bay of Bengal, when people told me of tigers with magical powers. And it is absolutely true about bears and many other animals using plants as medicine. Here is just one example. I, I read a story of a man watching a bear methodically strip the bark off a willow tree. The man was a hunter and he shot the bear. 
And when the bear was dead, he went over and looked in the mouth of the bear and found that all the willow bark, which has no nutritional value, had been chewed up into one big wad, and it was all mushed around just one tooth in the bear's mouth. And he pushed that away, and he saw that that tooth was embedded in a gum that was horribly inflamed. There was an abscess. Now, what do you think that willow bark was doing there? Well, willow bark is the source of salicylic acid, which is aspirin. And Native Americans have used willow bark tea for thousands of years to reduce inflammation and pain, which was exactly what that bear was doing. We now know that there are plenty of animals, including insects, that use plant medicine. And folks who watch animals have a great deal to learn from them. And this really should be no surprise, because animals, in the words of Henry Beston, a great author whose, whose work I adore, particularly The Outermost House, are gifted, he says, with extensions of the senses that we have lost or never attained. They are living by voices that we can't hear. He says they are other nations. They have superpowers. Elephants, for example, in the 1980s, it was discovered that elephants are literally speaking in voices that we cannot hear. They use infrasound below the threshold of human hearing to communicate with one another across vast distances. It had always been a mystery to scientists who would observe that in one area where elephants were being culled, a fancy name for murdered, that elsewhere elephants would be very upset as if they just received some horrible news. Well, they had, because they can communicate across vast distances, as we now know, whales can as well. Other animals can communicate in voices we can't hear. Bats, for example, can see with sound, as can dolphins. The dolphins with whom I swam in the Amazon could use their sonar to see inside my stomach to see inside my heart, to see the floppy valve that does not work in my heart, to see I had nothing growing in my womb. They knew so much about me, and I knew so little about them. And other senses that we've just begun to chronicle include those of our beautiful great white sharks. I got to um, uh, dive in a shark cage to meet these guys up close and personal for a book on great white sharks, and as the first shark I met came close to me in the cage, he didn't look or feel menacing at all, but he came close enough that I could see what looked like adorable little black freckles around his snout. Well, what those are, they are special organs called the ampullae of Lorenzini, with which the shark can sense the electrical <coughs> pulse of the hearts of its prey items. So that shark I met, whose name was Jacques, by the way, um, named, of course, after Jacques Cousteau, and um, he was, uh, there was radio telemetry on that shark. Um, he could sense my heart beating. So animals know so much about us. When we begin to learn from them, it can expand not only our senses, but our consciousness. Well, this is what started this book that just came out. I was talking with a dear friend of mine, Vicki Croak. Um, she wrote a wonderful book called Elephant Company, several others, but most recently Elephant Company. Um, and she came to interview me about what I had learned from studying animals and studying their abilities. And, um, we talked for, for a while, and this was being filmed. And just her last question was, you know, you've obviously learned so much in natural history about how animals behave and, and how they are thinking, feeling creatures as well. She said, but have animals ever taught you anything that you could take into your own life? What have animals shown you for you? 
And my answer was, what they've shown me is how to be a good creature. And this interview was archived online, and an editor at Houghton Mifflin, one of my publishers, happened to see it. And she said, Cy, that has to be your next book, and it has to be a memoir. Well, I had written one other memoir, and it was called The Good, Good Pig, and it was, um, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but it was about my life with an extraordinary teacher, Christopher Hogwood, who grew to be a 750-pound pig, a great Buddha master who taught me so much. But it's hard writing a memoir, and it's scary writing a memoir, because you have to write about your past, your thoughts and feelings, and sometimes dark stuff that may have happened in your life. And many of my friends, for example, never heard anything about my childhood. I never talked about it. But I realized to write this memoir, I needed to talk about my life too, because my life could kind of serve as the, the setting for the jewels who are these teachers of mine. So you have to reveal yourself to your readers in a memoir in a way that makes you feel very vulnerable. But it's the greatest thing that you can give your readers because then they can connect with you as well. And in this book, I talk about things that everyone has to deal with. I talk about loss and forgiveness. I talk about finding my destiny. and I. In every case, it has been an animal who has come forward to be my teacher and show me the way through. And it's my hope with this book to share with my readers that teachers are all around us ready to help, but we just need to learn to recognize them and not imagine that they're only the wonderful teachers that we have in the front of the classroom, that when we leave that classroom, teachers are all around us. And even before we enter the classroom, my first best teacher, I think, I'm going to introduce you to right now, and it was Molly. And you see, she's, she's the one on the right. And that is me <laughs> as a little person. Um, Molly actually saved my life to start with. I was... Um, at age two, something bad happened to me. I probably had uh, some brain damage, actually. And I wasn't growing, and I wasn't talking, and I wasn't running around. And my parents thought, what can we do to make this problem start? Well, happily, I had shared with my folks that I actually was a horse when I was very little. My, my mother, concerned, had rushed to the pediatrician who assured her that I would grow out of it, which I did when I announced that I was really a dog. And my big existential problem as, as a little kid was everyone wanted to show me how to be a little girl, and I had no interest in this. I wanted someone to show me how to be a dog. So my parents finally figured this out, and as a last-ditch measure to cause me to start growing and talking and running around, Molly came into my life. She saved my life, and then she showed me my destiny. And my destiny was to grow up to be like her. Now, everyone admires their older sister. Little girls <laughs> admire and idolize their older sisters. And I was no exception, but my older sister was a dog. And even though she was younger than me chronologically, I recognized even as a child that she quickly became a knowledgeable adult. And her knowledge surpassed mine. She could hear sounds that I didn't even detect. She could smell scents that I did not know were there. With the tapidum lucidum, the light reflecting mirror in the eye of carnivores, she could see in the dark when I was helplessly stumbling around. And my dream was to run away into the woods with Molly where she could teach me the secrets of the wild animals that she could smell and hear and see, but I could not. And this is what I have done with my life. I have basically run away into the woods 
all over the world, the cloud forests and the rain forests and the deserts and the seas to learn the secrets of the wild animals. And that's why I keep her picture on my desk to this day. My beloved Molly, she showed me my destiny. But how was I to get there? You know, some of us have an idea of what we want to do, but how do you do it? How do you get to that point? And I'll tell you how that happened for me as a young person. I went to college. I, you heard that I, I triple majored and I started, um, once I graduated, at working for a newspaper in New Jersey covering science. And I loved doing that. After five years, I took a vacation. My father gave me a ticket to Australia and I had always wanted to go because of the cool animals they have there. Animals like the southern hairy-nosed wombat. Now, look at this face. How could you resist the southern hairy-nosed wombat? They're related to koalas, but they live in holes in the ground, much like the mole we were learning about, but they're much bigger. And um, I found out about this organization, Earthwatch, that pairs paying laymen with, um, with scientific projects around the world and thought, I'm going to join Earthwatch, and I'll spend my vacation helping the scientist, Dr. Pamela Parker, of the Brookfield continent. Brookfield Zoo in Chicago at the Brookfield Conservation Park in South Australia study these animals. So we lived in tents and we studied the wombats and I fell deeply in love with Australia and all of the animals there and worked so hard and had a blast. I loved living in a tent. I loved cooking my, my food over a campfire. I loved waking up to discover that a big hairy spider was now in my tent that you know, wasn't gonna bother me, but looked really cool. I loved watching the, 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 the sunrise streaked with flying parrots. I loved all the kangaroos who bounced like little rubber balls over the landscape. I loved all of it, and I loved exploring this and learning about it. And Dr. Parker said, you know, I could just see you are on fire side to do this, and I wish I could hire you as my assistant but I can't do that because I don't have any funding. And I wish I could give you money for a ticket to come back here next year, but I can't do that either. She said, but you know what? Um, if you ever wanted to study Australian animals, you could stay at my research park. You could pitch your tent and I'd give you food. So I quit my job and moved to a tent in the outback and I studied these guys. These are emus who stand as tall as a man beside the kangaroo on the Australian coat of arms. But no one really knew what they did all day. No one really knew that much about them. And I was able to do the first real pilot study to see, well, what do they do? And what I did was I just apprenticed myself, myself to three emus who let me hang out with them. And I did it the, the same way Jane Goodall kind of apprenticed herself to the chimpanzees of Gombe in 1960. Instead of sneaking around and trying to look at them remotely, she let them know like, hey, I'm here, I'm harmless, I wanna learn from you. So I wore the same thing every day, my father's army jacket and a red kerchief, so they, they would recognize me and I could soon follow them just a, f a few feet away from them and see what they did all day. Now, you know, they weren't like making stock trades. They, they weren't like, um, they, they weren't doing anything shocking like that. They, they did the kinds of things you, you might think they would do, look for food and groom themselves and when they found water, they would drink it and I found out what they eat and I found out how far they travel and where they go. I found out they have a great sense of humor. They used to tease the ranger's dog. They knew, they're very smart, they knew exactly how long the, the dog's chain was. And they would go up to the dog, and they, they don't fly, they have these eight inch wing stumps, and their little stumpy wings they'd raise forward, and they'd jump up in the air, and they'd like, splash the air with their huge dinosaurian feet, and throw their necks up and their heads up and down, and the dog would be just going crazy, and, and running to the end of the chain and then bouncing back, and they thought this was hilarious. And when they would 
do this for a while, and then they get tired of it, and then they just kind of walk over there and sit down and groom themselves to just enjoy how much they had tortured this poor dog. Anyway, um, they have a great sense of humor. And although they are strong enough, they can run 40 miles an hour, they can sever fencing wire with a single kick, um, they you know, never threaten me in any way. They taught me, one, how to do field research. But the other thing that they taught me was how I could use in my writing not just my intellect, not just my experience, but also my heart, my emotions, my intuition, and how by forming a relationship with the animals that I wrote about, that could be a powerful tool of inquiry. That could be revelatory. And they showed me the path that I would take. I realized after living for six months in a tent in the outback, developing a mat in my hair that caused me to look like a dog who hadn't been combed, not looking in a mirror for weeks or months at a time, I was not going to struggle back into pantyhose and work in an office where someone else was going to tell me what to do. No, I was going to continue doing this sort of research and writing about it with a perspective that at that time was fairly new in a way that honored each animal's individuality in a way that invited the reader to approach and care for not just the species I was writing about, but the individuals who love their lives perhaps as much as we love ours. Well, I'd love to introduce you to another teacher. My teacher was a big, fat pig. Um, when I first met Christopher Hogwood, he was very little, but he quickly um, grew to 750 pounds and which surprised my husband and I. Um, and he, like I told you, was this great big Buddha master. He taught me so much. One of the things that he brought into my life that I'd never had before was the friendship of children. And as a child, most of my friends were animals or plastic dinosaurs or completely, completely imaginary. I did not know what it was like to have children as friends. And this was fine. I didn't have a miserable childhood or anything. It was perfectly fine. But it was Chris who taught me how much fun kids were. And how? Through Pig Spa, which we instituted in Hancock, New Hampshire. Once kids found out there was a, a big spotted pig living in the yard, they instantly came over. And what we would do is we would take big buckets of soapy water and we would wash him. He would lie on his side. We would scrub him and we would braid the, the hair on his tail. We would rub the hoof maker into his hooves till they gleaned. And then he, we would get up and we would all eat chocolate donuts. Who wouldn't love that? <laughs> and Christopher was such a social, happy guy. He loved everybody. Now, he also had a reason to be calm, because unlike most pigs, he was being raised by a vegetarian and a Jew. <laughs> he knew he wasn't going anywhere. His retirement plan was not to be bacon. People used to ask, what are you going to do with him? And I would say, well, what are you doing with your grandchildren? You know. <laughs> I wouldn't guess and say, oh, looks like your child might dress out at 45 pounds. I mean, you know. No, he was a member of the family. The thing was, he really is the one who taught me what family is. Because when he came along into my life, it was a time when my blood family, my parents, had disowned me. I was an only child, but they disowned me for marrying my husband because he was Jewish. Now the funny thing is, after my father died, my mother found out that my father was Jewish. <laughs> so she'd also married a Jew. But my parents could not forgive me for this. 
but Christopher could forgive me for being a person and for all the failings that come with being a human. And so while my blood family was not picture perfect, my chosen family, which was multi-species, which contained children who were not my own, which contained people of all different sexes and races and belief systems, that was a family made out of love, not out of blood. And Christopher Hogwood was the one who taught me that. And it's something I'll never forget or tire of sharing. Well, another teacher is this ermine. And the story of this ermine is one that transpired over the course of merely minutes. That sometimes an encounter with an animal only has to last for minutes in order to change your life. I owe this ermine for teaching me forgiveness. After my parents disowned me, they never ever accepted my husband. But they knew I loved them. And when my father first got sick, and then my mother got sick, I was with both of them when they died. My mother had died earlier in the year on the Christmas day that I met this ermine. Now I met the ermine who was, the, as you know, the white-coated version of a, of a weasel. Um, we have several different species of, of weasel. I'm sure you have them here in Arkansas. I don't know where they turn white in the winter. But um, they weigh as much as a handful of coins. They're tiny animals. So I met this ermine on a Christmas day that I was bringing to my hen house big bowl of delicious hot popped popcorn. Every Christmas day, that's what I bring to my hens. And my hens are friends of mine who I've known since they were a couple days old. Um, they come in the mail, Murray McMurray or Cackle Hatchery. And I raise them in my office and they sit on my head and in my sweater and they are totally imprinted on me and we love and recognize each other and when you get out of your car you feel like you're the Beatles because they can't wait to see you, they're running up to see you. And you just, you just feel great and they, they love to be picked up and kissed and petted. And so just to give you an idea of how much I loved these ladies, this Christmas morning, imagine how distressed I was when I found one of my girls dead on the floor and her head was stuck in the corner and I went to pick her up by her yellow scaly feet and I couldn't pick her up. Something had a hold of her head. And I pulled and I pulled and then this head pops out of the corner. This tiny little animal looking at me, a monster, 120 pounds, five foot five, a horrible monster, but fearlessly with its eyes boring into my face, looks at me as if to say, give me back my chicken or else. <laughs> or else what? You know, the animal was ready to take me down. The guy, I mean, this, this animal will take down hairs. You know how big a hair is? Much, much bigger than a little animal. They, it was this big. They, they weigh nothing, and yet, my gosh, they are just like all the ferocity in the world. All the wolverines and bears and tigers and lions concentrated into something this big. I could not be mad at that animal. Even though the animal had just killed someone I loved, I could see the beauty and the courage and the strength and the determination of this incandescent life before me. And I realized at that moment that that ermine was like my mother. My mother had grown up in a poor area of Arkansas, not like dirt poor, but she had hunted and ate squirrels. Um, she, now I'm, I'm 60 years old, and she was, gosh, when she died, she was 76, and that was in like 1996 or something like that. So 
this was quite a while ago, and not many women went to college, particularly if they were from if they were poor from rural Arkansas. But she went to college and she was valedictorian of her class. And she became a pilot. She flew a plane. And then she moved to Washington, D.C. and worked for the FBI. And then she married her a bird colonel who became a brigadier general. And the next thing she knew, she had people cleaning her house. There were, there were in the army, they give you like a helicopter and a yacht and they get, you know, a staff car. And they, they, give, they give you a cook in your house who will carve the meats at your dinner parties. And she was going to wonderful exotic places around the world. She got what she wanted. And she did so because of her ferocious determination and courage. And my father, who, as I said, was a brigadier general. He was a survivor of the Bataan Death March. He had lived through years of captivity. He was a POW in World War II um, in Japanese prison camp, which was no party. And I admired him so much. But I realized at that moment, when I saw that ermine, that one reason that I had grown up realizing that if it could be done by a person, it could be done by me. One reason for that was my mother. And I realized then how much I loved her and how much I missed her. And that was a wonderful Christmas blessing from a ferocious, beautiful killer. Now this little animal looks like something that Dr. Seuss had cooked up with Dakin toys. This is a tree kangaroo. Tree kangaroos are also real animals. They are actual kangaroos who live in the trees, and they live in one of the most remote places in the world, Papua New Guinea, the Stone Age Island, which was largely unexplored for ages because explorers who went there got eaten by the natives. But Today, the, the native people are actually very, very advanced, even though they're happy to show you that their, their parents' skull caves have all these heads in them. Um, they are real smart about conservation. They're fabulous folks. But anyway, these, this tree kangaroo um, also helped save my life. And um, I talk about that in, in the book, What these animals showed me was that even when you think all is lost, even when you think your world is coming to an end, even when you think there's no happiness left in your life, I was once at a point like that. And these animals helped me fall back in love with the world again. And that's another message that I wanted these teachers to bring to all my readers is that the world is waiting with open arms to not only teach you, but love you back into life. One of my chapters is devoted to an animal that a lot of people would think of as a slimy monster. And I'm going to close by talking a little bit about octopus. Some of you may have read my book, The Soul of an Octopus, or read my essay that started that book out, which is called Deep Intellect. And for this book, I was going to explore the issue of consciousness by getting to know the mind of a mollusk. And that is a sentence that would have caused a great deal of cognitive dissonance just a few years ago. How could a mollusk, a clam, a snail, an octopus, even have a mind? Their brains don't look like brains of any kind. They wrap around the throat. Three-fifths of their neurons aren't even in their brains. You would have to go to outer space or science fiction to find a creature more unlike a human being than an octopus. They taste with their skin. They change color and shape. They can pour their baggy, boneless bodies 
through an opening the size of an orange, even if they weigh 100 pounds. They are so unlike us. And yet, I made friends with octopuses who recognized me, would look into my face, and whose arms would come boiling up out of the water to meet mine. And the very first octopus I met, I was absolutely struck, dumbstruck, by the clear curiosity in the eyes of this animal who is separated from our kind by half a billion years. I did not expect to be able to become friends with someone like that, but I did. And in this book, I write about one of the octopuses I knew, Octavia. Octavia, I had met pretty much just within days of her arrival at the New England Aquarium, and I knew her until the end of her life. During the time we knew each other, we played together, we used toys together, I introduced her to a lot of my friends, she taught me so, so much. And then one day, our relationship profoundly changed. This has happened with friends of mine when they have babies. Well, she laid eggs. And used to be we'd play together and she would give me hugs and kisses like she's doing here. But here's her eggs. You can see in the right-hand corner, they're hanging down like globes of grapes. They're each the size of like a grain of, of, of rice. And she laid about 100,000 of these. Well, the thing is, octopuses only lay eggs once at the end of their lives, and they spend the last months of their lives in their lair, tending and cleaning and protecting their eggs. They don't go hunting, and in the wild they don't eat. Now, when she was in her lair, she could not look up at our faces through the water. She was not seeing us, and she was not interested in playing. We could hand her on a grabber. We could hand her fish, and she would take it and eat it. But she did not want to play with us. She did not want to interact with us. And she didn't know. She had no way of knowing that her eggs were infertile because there was no Mr. Octopus. And she just cleaned and cared for them and kind of broke my heart that they were never going to hatch. But she didn't know. Well, normally, for a giant Pacific octopus, after six months, your eggs hatch, and you use your last breaths to blow your hatchling babies out of your lair into the open ocean where they become part of the plankton. Well, six months went by, still her eggs didn't hatch. She continued to live seven, eight, nine, more than nine months. She's still alive. Eggs are now starting to disintegrate. Well. As happens with all of us, when we age, her body started to disintegrate too. And one day it was clear that she had an infection in her eye. And Bill Murphy, who was the senior aquarist at uh, Cold Marine, felt she should no longer have to be on exhibit. So he was going to move her so that she could be in a quiet, dark place all the time. And when he moved her behind the scenes, I wondered, would she still even recognize me? Octopuses only live like three to five years at the longest. The giant Pacific octopus is believed to be one of the longest lived octopuses. And she was very near death at that time. And we hadn't seen each other for like 10 months, which is like 25 years for an octopus. So when I went in to essentially say goodbye to her and take the lid off her tank, I was not prepared to see that she floated immediately to the top of the tank to greet me. She remembered me. She remembered me, and even though she was old and sick and just so near death, she made the effort to come up and hold and taste me once again. And I handed her a fish. She just dropped it. She wasn't interested in the fish. What she was interested in was seeing her old friend. Now, I don't know exactly what it feels like to be an octopus. 
or what love feels like to an octopus, but I know what it feels like to me. And I know the transformative power of love and the transformative power of knowing someone that different from me who I could love brought home and helped me understand a saying that I had learned long ago from Thales of Miletus, a pre-Socratic Greek philosopher. And I want to share that with you. He says, the universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. Now, what does that mean? Well, Octavia and the others taught me what that means. The universe is alive. All these beautiful, incandescent lives, all these loving, all these magical creatures with powers that we can only imagine. The universe is alive with them. The universe is aflame with them. And the universe is full of gods. He's not talking about many different kinds of gods, but about the holiness of this world. And I think getting to be friends with an octopus brought home for me more than any other experience, the reverence that we owe to our world, to its beauty and to its strangeness, and to the wholeness that we can only feel when we feel part of that family that is our home. Thank you. If folks have any any questions, I should look at my watch and see. Um, yeah, if, if folks have any questions um, or comments, I think we have someone with a microphone who's going to run around and um, and take those questions or comments. Is there like food waiting? Are people like waiting? To <laughs> Gosh, I don't, I don't, there's a hand. Thank you. Hey. Hi again. So obviously you've written many different styles of works. You've written memoirs and articles and books. How would you say your writing style changes depending on what sort of form of writing you are working on? Oh, wow, that's a real writer, writerly question, but no surprise. Um, well, certainly when I'm writing for children, my voice changes a little bit. Um, I, I very much respect young people who are just as smart as I am. They just haven't been alive quite as long as I have. So that, that changes. Um, for memoir, um, I, I have to talk more about my own personal history. Um, and when I started writing, you know, coming out of a journalism background, we used to say that I, the word I, just did not belong in anything you wrote. That has actually changed um, quite a bit. Now, in, in a typical article in which you are doing the reporting for a newspaper, for example, you would not say I, this, that, or the other thing. In fact, you would like do a, a whole end run around that. And if, for example, you know, you were you were interviewing Jane Goodall and she handed you a, a baby chimp, she would you would have to say she handed the a visitor the baby chimp, even though you were the visitor. You would you would have to remain invisible in some of that. And I um, was trained in that tradition. But increasingly I've have um, moved towards putting um, myself in the picture as a way of welcoming my readers in. 
And I'm very lucky. I pretty much get to write what I want now. I used to, I mean, I never had to write about, you know, the, the fur industry is really great. I mean, I never had to do stuff like that. I never did anything that I thought was, you know, morally um, didn't fit with, with what I believed in. But I pretty much get to accept or pitch stories that I'm particularly interested in so I can kind of write it the, the way I want. And people want, you know, if they're going to ask me to write it, they know what my voice kind of sounds like. And, um, but what's interesting is I, I don't often reread my stuff, but I recently had to reread one of my second book, Spell of the Tiger. Um, I had to reread it because I was going to Spain two weeks ago. It was coming out in Spanish. And uh, I noticed my voice was different in that book. And I think it was different because of the Bengali language. I think that the, the not that I speak Bengali in any decent way, but I think that language affected my language somewhat. So um, you can choose, a dis you know, you can develop a, a distinctive voice of your own. It's also perfectly fine to have different voices for different occasions. But I think right now I have a distinctive voice and you can perceive it, whether I'm writing a picture book for little people who can't read, a book for fifth graders, or a book for adults, I think. Oh good, now hands are showing up. I'm so happy. Um, okay. Without, um, since you didn't really have a traditional science education and for your undergraduate, how did you make up, um, cover that ground whenever you wanted to get into nature writing? Oh, good question. Well, I actually took a lot of biology. They just would not give me the fourth major because they'd never done a three major before, so. Um, but, my ignorance was also kind of a tool because it connected me with my readers who uh, just didn't, you know, they didn't know. And um, the whole point is once your reader does know, then your reader cares and then your, your reader acts. And that was what I wanted to happen. So, you know, you, you, you don't want your, um, you don't want your sources to conclude you're a complete ignoramus you want to honor them by, by knowing a little bit about what you're going to ask them. But it's also helpful to, to bring a great deal of curiosity to it. And generally, I found that scientists who I interview and work with are absolutely delighted to educate me about this. And particularly when I'm writing the books for kids, they just cannot wait to, to talk to those readers. And it works out terrific. Wait, there were, there were hands up. I, oh. I still have the microphone. She just oh, passed oh, I'm it sorry. to me. Um, you've done a lot of things that, especially from I know where we're sitting, seem so and are so heroically brave dropping all of your life and moving to a tent in Australia, diving into these, um, into these mangrove swamps where there are admittedly man-eating tigers. Um, and I guess I wonder, I don't, I don't know if this is too personal to ask, but were there moments when you felt genuinely afraid and where did you find the strength to keep following this amazing goal that you have in the face of those fears? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have never, ever, ever been afraid of any of the animals that I've been around. But I'm not fearless. I am afraid of failure. And at 60 years old, with 26, 7, 8 books under my belt, I'm still afraid that I'm not good enough to write that next book. Um, it's just part of the thing, you know. It's just part of the territory. And the way I get over that is when I can't believe in myself, and there's plenty of times that I just can't, I'll believe in my teachers. But, you know, everyone has stuff that they're afraid of. 
You know, some people are afraid of heights, and some people are afraid of snakes, and some people are afraid of spiders, and I'm not afraid of those things. Um, but I'm afraid of failure. And I'm afraid of cocktail parties. <laughs> You know, I just read this really fascinating thing. Your biology people will be super interested in this. And this is kind of apropos of nothing, but um, I was reading a book that's fixing to get published. You, you get to read books before they're pub published when you're an author, because people want you to blurb their book. And um, this book is called Never Home Alone, and it's about <laughs> microbes. And it discusses the, um, a, uh, I think it's a plasmonium, that is uh, found in, I knew we'd be talking about feces, cat feces. This is why when you're pregnant, you're not supposed to clean the cat box because of this particular um, organism. Well, the organism, when it's ingested by mice, makes the mice not afraid of cats. Why does it do this? Because then the mouse will be eaten by the cat and the organism, the disease organism, gets to be in a cat gut where it wants to be to complete its life cycle. Okay, this is very interesting. It also affects humans in this way when you've been exposed to it. I did not know. This. So maybe I've just eaten a lot of cat feces. <laughs> so that could be the other explanation. <laughs> Oh, wow. Man, well, I mean, there's a lot of cool places I've just, I've never been in the Galapagos, for example. You know, I've never been to Antarctica. Um, I've never been to Madagascar. We have professors that do work there. Do you want to come along? Oh, boy. <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to lose your number. <laughs> Thank you so much. Gosh. Well, the next one, this is kind of freakish. I, didn't, I did not know um, Earthwatch gives out fellowships until they gave me one. And they're sending me in January to study doles, um, Asiatic wild dogs, who communicate with each other, not by barking, but by whistling, and who can jump seven feet into the air from a standstill. And I, I'm going to just like blog for them. I don't have to write a book or anything. And then the, the next book that I'm working on, um, the next book that I'm going to actively research is I'm going to do some more scuba, and I'm going to go to Ecuador and Peru to study giant manta rays with Dr. Kirsten Forsberg, who's protecting these incredible, I mean, they, these things weigh a ton. They look like a shark that like a big steamroller rolled over it. They jump out of the water. They actually flap their wings because they are shaped, you know, like manta rays. They, they'll flap their wings. They'll fly and then go back into the sea. And they're very intelligent, long-lived animals. So I just, I just cannot wait. And then I have ideas lined up like planes at Logan Airport. I mean, I... There's so much I want to do, but it, interestingly, I'm also being kind of called to write about turtles, and I think that God wants me to slow down. 